So it is finally time for Devil May Cry 5. In some ways, the last year and a half of my life has been leading up to this. Since day one, almost a year and a half ago, people were saying, ooh, just wait till he gets to 5. And we're finally here. After a reboot that did not satisfy hardcore fans and years without a true sequel, DMC5 had everything riding on it when it came out back in 2019. It had been over a decade since DMC4, and it's been almost four or five months since my last video. So let's jump into DMC5 and see if it was worth the wait. Our story begins in medias res, that's the fancy word for you don't know what's going on yet because starting a story in the middle is cool, with Dante, a newly one-armed Nero, and emo Stranger Things fighting Throne Xemnas from Kingdom Hearts 2. Dante gets yeeted away into a coma for the next month, and we go back to see how Nero lost his arm. Some years after DMC4, the events of the story are set into motion with Nero getting his Devil Bringer ripped off by a mysterious stranger, who turns it into Yamato and opens a portal with it, and says, I'm taking this back. Okay, yeah, it's obviously Virgil, we get it. It seems a little odd to make this out like some kind of mystery when anyone with a passing knowledge of the franchise is gonna immediately know who it is and thus where the story is going. In the scene, we're also introduced to Nero's new sidekick, Nico, a fun inventor with some extremely strange writing. That's why I'm building that well-functioning art. <laughs> She's actually a really fun character. I, I like seeing her lighthearted energy bounce off the more serious characters, so I like her. Nero and the mysterious V. Oh, because Virgil starts with V and this is the fifth game, I get it. <laughs> they start destroying the roots of the Clyphoth tree summoned by Urizen, the big throne demon from the prologue. Nero rescues Lady, Trish gets rescued later, and the two women fighters are completely and utterly wasted in the story. Pretty big bummer there. You'd think as the only significant female combatants in the series, they'd try to give them something to do, but no, they just get to be naked and covered in goo, I guess. All right. Nero makes it to Yurizen, but still just isn't strong enough to do anything to him. As Nero fades from exhaustion, a demon, nearly unrecognizable but still familiar, saves him. Who could this be? Well, I mean, it's Dante, obviously, but the dramatic reveals that the game can pull off with this non-linear story and multiple points of view is actually really enjoyable. We go back in time several times to see how Dante got here. First, we go back to see V finding Dante a month after the first Urizen fight in the prologue, beaten and comatose, just waking up moments before V creepily stabs him with Sparta. Then we go back again to see Dante first approach the Clyphoth tree to fight Urizen in the prologue. That's a flashback within a flashback for those of you keeping score. Forward again, but not all the way forward, to Dante finding the ruins of his old family home and realizing that just as Yamato was able to separate Virgil's demon and human sides, Rebellion has the power to fuse Dante with the demonic power of the sword Sparta. With a new form that looks just all kinds of badass, we finally go all the way forward again to Dante swooping in to save Nero. Even with his new form though, Dante isn't quite able to put Yurizen down, who runs off to the top of the evil tree to wait for it to make him a fancy fruit or something? I guess that's what the tree does. The gang is finally all together, and from here you basically just play as all three characters, making their way to the final fight with Urizen atop the Clyphoth tree. Also, Dante gets a cool hat. Does this cutscene remind anyone else of, like, an old Source Filmmaker dance video or something? It's something about the lighting. It's bizarre, and I kinda love it. After another fight with Urizen, the coolest fusion scene of all time happens, and Virgil is reborn. Fusion! Ha! As obvious as it was that this moment was coming, it's still extremely effective. And it's a credit to Virgil's great design, voice acting, and just his sheer charisma that he's in the game for all of 30 minutes and he absolutely steals the show. All he really has to do is sit around and wait for everyone to come to him, and it's the most badass thing in the whole game. As Dante and Virgil face off one last time, just like before, a mysterious figure shows up at the last second and stops them. And just like with Dante saving Nero, we go back one last time to see how we got here. Nero, as always one step behind Dante, takes a moment to call Kyrie for a little pep talk. Incredibly, she's still better utilized here than she is in DMC4. And in a last desperate bid to save his only remaining family, he regains his buster ability, unlocks his devil trigger form, almost angelic in appearance, and flies in to stop his uncle and father from killing each other. You know, honestly, this game has really cemented Nero as my absolute favorite character in the series. He's only in two games, but he's really grown as a character, from being an occasionally fun Dante knockoff in DMC4 whose only motivation was rescuing the world's most boring love interest, to a solid, charming, well-rounded character. I love his banter with the other characters, I love his new design and new weapons, but most of all, I love how he's just kind of over the melodrama of it all. 
Well, okay, Nero's no stranger to being pretty melodramatic himself, but I like how his basic stance on the main climax of the game is that Dante and Virgil need to stop being such babies. There are other ways of settling their differences. Dante and Virgil are like, we are brothers, we must fight for our vision of justice or whatever, and Nero just comes in and says, hey, could you two get over yourselves already? Like, I will literally slap the shit out of you two until you stop acting like whiny children. I mean, he puts it a little more eloquently than that, but you get the picture. Anyway, Nero finally manages to convincingly beat his dad in a fight, and Virgil, being Virgil, has no choice but to respect Nero's power, and agrees to help Dante destroy the Clyphoth from the underworld. The game ends with a classic passing of the torch moment from Dante to Nero as protector of mankind, a hell of a lot stronger than the way DMC4 did it, and we get to play as Nero and Dante protecting their respective sides of the portal between worlds as the credits roll. DMC5's story overall is easily my favorite of the series, though as I've said in previous videos, story is generally not my focus for video games. That's especially true with a series as gameplay focused as DMC is, and after DMC4, I really did not have high expectations for 5. But goddamn if I wasn't genuinely impressed by DMC 5's story. It feels like a story for the fans through and through, and if you've got any amount of emotional investment in these characters, you won't be disappointed in this story. So this is by far the biggest Devil May Cry game ever made, and there's been a surprising number of changes to the basic DMC formula in this game. So let's go through some of those before we get to the character-specific stuff. The fully unified world of the previous games is gone, now each mission takes place in a completely disconnected area. Some people might be disappointed by this, but the trade-off is that the devs now have a lot more freedom in how they structure their story. All previous games, well, all previous decent games in the series, necessitated a straightforward linear story that all took place mostly in one location or a handful of nearby locations. DMC4 is by far the biggest victim of this rigid story structure. All of the locations had to flow easily into the next since they wanted a single unified game world, but we didn't have time to give Dante his own part of the world, so I guess he'll just have to do Nero's backwards. Yikes. DMC5 says, screw all of that, any mission can take place anywhere in our world with any character in our story at any point in time. And the levels are still open enough for some exploration to find hidden missions, collectibles, and alternate paths. But there's no more backtracking, thank god. The sprawling, intricate, connected world of DMC 1 and 3 is gone, but in its place we've got a sprawling, intricate plot, with storylines and characters crossing over one another, flashbacks and flash-forwards with different characters, and it's easily the most interesting plot in the whole series for me. Absolutely a worthwhile trade, and honestly, one I wish the series had made sooner. Well, I mean, it did in the reboot, but I think if I praise that game any more than I already have, the DMC secret police are gonna come take me away to Malay Island or something. Items have gotten quite a bit of a revamp. I like some of the changes, others not so much. Removing healing items, completely fine. Letting you revive with either gold orbs or red orbs, awesome. Giving you a million gold orbs just for logging in and playing normally, not as big a fan of this. At some points I had upwards of 30 gold orbs just sitting in my inventory, just waiting to help me cheap out at any point on DMD. I generally tried to restrict myself to only using them if I was really close to beating a boss or just any time as V, cause those levels started to take long enough without a bunch of restarts, but as those D ranks in my total rankings will reveal, there were times where I just got frustrated and used a bunch of gold orbs to tank my way through a level. I'm not proud of that, but I'd rather be upfront and admit it than try to hide it, and this channel was never going to be Dongery 2 anyway, so whatever. To that point, I think Son of Sparta, or Hard, is basically the perfect difficulty for DMC5, at least for me and where I'm at in terms of skill and dedication to this game. DMD is fun, but it ends up feeling more like a chore at times since enemies have so much more health. I don't mind how much damage they do, that's fine, it's supposed to be hard. But I just got kind of bored on some of the simpler fights that I could survive pretty easily, but they just took a really long ass time. I originally was going to record my DMD playthrough for this video, but it was just taking too damn long. So the early missions in this footage are on DMD, but after mission 10 I switched back to Son of Sparta just to save myself some hard drive space recording all this footage. Real impact spam starts to look very appealing when you're staring down the barrel of some of these HP bars, and you can't afford more hard drive space to save all the damn footage, and don't even get me started yet on V's levels. Though the improved enemy design still makes these more enjoyable than most levels in DMC4. Yeah, it's no secret that enemy design in previous Devil May Cry games has been a little up and down. One had death scissors, two is two, we can leave it at that. Three had soul eaters, enigmas, the fallen, dulahans, all super annoying to fight, and four, 
Before, it's like they were trying to see how hard they could ruin a good combat system with shitty, aggravating enemies. It would be faster to list the enemies in DMC4 that don't have some kind of frustrating way to ruin your combos, make approaching them impossible, or hide away and be nearly impossible to damage effectively. And this is doubly true when playing as Dante. But 5? The enemies in 5 are… fantastic. Finally, every enemy has tells that are clear and readable. Every enemy can be comboed, and they don't feel like damage sponges either. No enemy requires one particular weapon or strategy to beat, like the chimeras in 4 or blood goils in 3, forcing you to only use guns. Every enemy has patterns to learn and read, weaknesses and openings to exploit, and for once there aren't any that feel deliberately designed to be frustrating. An enemy being hard to beat isn't necessarily frustrating. Frustrating is an enemy that hides in the walls and is practically immune to half your weapons. Frustrating is an enemy that pops out of the ground constantly just to undo your progress if a single pixel comes into contact with it. That's the kind of enemy design that held 3 and 4 back from being masterpieces. Now, does this alone make 5 a masterpiece? Well, yeah, kind of. Even the most contentious new enemy, I think, is actually perfectly fine. The Fury is the new Blitz replacement, a fast, tanky demon that forces you to fight on its terms by frequently becoming intangible and hitting incredibly hard. I actually enjoy Fury fights a whole lot more than I ever enjoyed any Blitz fights in DMC4, and that's partially thanks to the changes they made to Dante, specifically with Royal Guard, but more on that later. And their attacks are just telegraphed enough to be fun to time and block, since you can see what they're doing as they're winding up. Unlike the Blitz, which just turned into a massive particle effects before attacking. I got a lot of comments hyping up the Fury as some kind of anger-inducing noob killer enemy on the level of the Blitz, but it's really not even close to that bad. The Fury is a little tough, but I wouldn't call it a bad enemy by any means. Special mention also definitely has to be given to DMC5's bosses. Previous games in the series always had their problems with boss design. There were good ones and plenty of them, but you'd be hard-pressed to argue that there wasn't at least a handful of stinkers in every game. One has the repeated blob on the floor fight, two has only terrible boss fights, three has uninspired bosses like Gigapede, Garion, and the infamously terrible Arkham fight, and four might take home the gold medal of shit boss fights with the savior. But out of the around 14 total boss fights in DMC5, I can't think of a single one that I don't genuinely enjoy every time. The big gorilla demon, every Urizen fight, the chicken lady, the fucking motorcycle dude, all fantastic fights. And the best part is no minigame bosses. You know how so many games like to have boss fights whose mechanics feel completely detached from the rest of combat? DMC5 has none of that, except arguably Gilgamesh who's really more of a platforming challenge than a normal fight. But still, DMC5's bosses all feel rooted in the standard combat mechanics of the game, and so they feel more like massively powerful normal enemies, instead of minigame boss fights, which have a tendency to feel more like scripted segments where if you play the little game the boss does, you'll be able to wail on their weak spot for a few seconds. Boring. That's why everyone, myself included, loves the Virgil fights, because he feels the most like a culmination of the skills you've been learning in normal combat. There's no gimmick with Virgil, it's just a straight up brawl. His attacks are super satisfying to dodge, and you actually get to juggle and combo him when you find an opening, which is great. Virgil is fast, unrelenting, and difficult, and he's the best boss fight in the series. The boss lineup in DMC5 just makes me so happy. But if there's one thing about this game that just makes me kind of sad, it's the fact that DMC5 has basically made 4 obsolete for players like me. For high skill players, I'm sure DMC4's systems still have some appeal, but for me, there's just no reason to go back. Just last video, I was praising DMC4 Dante's variety, but honestly, 5 kind of exposes a lot of 4's gameplay weaknesses. After playing DMC5 Dante, Lucifer's moveset feels pretty blatantly unfinished. It has a handful of ground combos that barely feel distinct from each other, one air move, and three swordmaster moves that all feel pretty interchangeable. Cool idea, not actually that much to do with it unless, again, you're really dedicated to mastering this game. And let's not even get into the level gimmicks. If this was DMC4, I'm sure we'd have to play a little mini game to hit the Nidhogg hatchlings around like tops just to open the path forward. That said, I think DMC5's levels could have done with a little variety. I know that may sound weird after I just complained about 4's levels, but hear me out. It's not that having platforming and puzzles in a combat-centric game like DMC is inherently a bad idea. It's just that 4's were obnoxiously awful and should never have existed, and I think 5's better air control would have made some light platforming pretty fun, and the one secret mission with the grappling hook is pretty decent. Actually kinda reminds me of the reboot, which, controversial take, has by far the best non-combat gameplay in the entire series. Basically no contest. 
but DMC5 feels a little too much like hallway walking simulator anytime you're not fighting. The Nidhogg hatchlings are a pretty meaningless way to pad for time, same with hitting big red zits to clear out vines blocking your path. It's a whole lot of push button to continue game, thankfully without any stupid dice mini games attached. Now, of course, to be clear, if I had to choose between 4 or 5's level design, I'll take 5 every single time. But a little variety would have been nice, that's all. I know we're all here for the combat, but, you know, I like puzzles, I like platforming, good platforming, and good puzzles, not this. Ugh, poor Nero, man, he had to endure so much punishment in those levels, but he's got some new toys in this game, so let's take a closer look at the characters. Nero retains most of his basic moveset from DMC4. The classic Red Queen sword is back with a couple new combos, a diving attack that's great for closing distance, and the ability to rev while running, and air taunt. Pretty solid additions all around there. Blue Rose fires a little slower and doesn't have a decent charge shot until after you beat the game once, so that's kind of a bummer. And his Devil Bringer is... well, it's gone. <laughs> Not gonna lie, it's a pretty big disappointment for Nero to be without his most iconic weapon. Instead, Nero now has a sweet robot arm that can do rocket punches, whips, energy beams, and Zawardo? Okay, uh, never mind, I'm not disappointed anymore, this is actually pretty awesome. The Devil Breaker system is Nero's big new selling point, and it's a pretty damn good one. It's hard not to miss the powerful and brutal busters, not to mention his Devil Trigger, but the sheer variety on display here is pretty impressive. I won't go through all of them since there's 8 Devil Breakers, each with at least 2 moves, but but they're real fun to use. The one that shoots a rocket punch and lets you fly around on it like a skateboard is a particular favorite of mine. My one and only gripe here is Nero's attack effects. His character animation is great as always, but with the more realistic style, a lot of the effects that were there in DMC4 to give his moves a little extra punch are gone, and a few of his busters look straight up terrible. Nero, you can throw monsters three times your size around like they're filled with helium. Why are you gingerly lifting this knight and doing a weak looking power slam? His attack effects that used to look big and powerful in anime as hell are replaced with this really underwhelming distortion effect. Streak and Caliber are by far the biggest victims of this. They just look so weak now. Sound effects were way crunchier in 4 as well. Now Streak is just a little basic sword swipe sound effect when it used to sound way more powerful. <laughs> The fire effects on his EX moves I think are up to personal preference, but I miss the red trail and I think the old fire effects honestly kind of looked better. That's just me though. And this really is a minor gripe because Nero has so many moves and the majority of them look just as good as DMC4 or better. Charge shots, busters, devil breakers, they mostly look and feel great. It's just some of the basic moves that I think could have used a little more visual flair. Then again, this game's visuals are already incredibly busy, so maybe they just felt that some of the old attack effects got in the way of readability or clashed too much with the new realistic aesthetic. I... did he just try to put a demon's freaky monster limb into an arm bar? Did he just do a spinning vertical suplex on that dude? Okay, never mind. Nero's attack animations are perfect. Nero for WrestleMania 37. Nero also has my favorite story moment in the series, when he unlocks his true devil trigger. This moment is great because it does something that I felt the other games tried to do, but didn't deliver on all that successfully. This moment ties the gameplay and story together. For your entire first playthrough of the game, you are really going to feel the absence of Nero's DT and Buster. Seeing this big triumphant display of power and will in the story, and combining that with the gameplay experience of getting to play as Nero at his full potential again with all the tools you missed from DMC4, is a really great moment because it's happening to you while it's also happening to the character. Yeah, there were times in previous DMC games that tried storytelling through gameplay like this. In DMC3, I got my ass handed to me by the first Virgil fight over and over the first time I played it, which really made him seem like an opponent I just wasn't ready for, mirroring Dante's own loss at the end of that fight. And in DMC2, I felt the utter boredom on Dante's face at all times throughout the game. Yeah, easy target, I know. But this moment in DMC5 really genuinely delivered, and after feeling like Nero was just kind of incomplete for the entire first playthrough, finally getting back his Devil Trigger and Buster felt so good, and it made me excited to immediately start a new playthrough on Son of Sparta. Part of me misses Nero's stand, but I love the angel wings. Not only are they wings, claws, and fists, but their angelic look makes for a great contrast with Dante and Virgil's new, more demonic sin devil triggers. I was really not sure if I was going to get to keep DT and Buster for a new playthrough. It was such a pivotal story moment that I was genuinely afraid that I wasn't going to get to use them outside that fight in the story. But when I started up Son of Sparta and started bustering enemies, firing off massive charge shots, experimenting with his new DT, and still getting to use all of his devil breakers, that's when I was sold. DMC5 is the best DMC game, and this is my favorite character. So next up we have V. 
It's probably not controversial to say that V is my least favorite character to play as in DMC5. The idea behind him is really interesting, story-wise and gameplay-wise. His physically fragile body represents Virgil's hate for his weak human side, and he uses demon familiars all based on enemies from DMC1 when he was trapped as Nello Angelo. Thematically, this is great. As an idea for a character, it's really, really cool. Seeing your character sit on the sidelines, menacingly reading poetry as his minions tear enemies apart with claws, lightning bolts, and lasers is a great idea. Goth kid evil mastermind by way of Pokemon. I, I mean, I'm down with that, in theory. It's just that in execution, I'm not as enthusiastic. V is a ranged fighter who needs his familiars to basically do everything for him except finishing off enemies. X and Y control Griffin and Shadow respectively, and you can spend DT to let them automatically fight for you, in case you weren't already bored enough standing there mashing buttons. You can also use your DT to summon Nightmare, who I didn't recognize as the blob on the floor monster at first, but I guess that makes sense now. Nightmare is the only one that will fight automatically without you doing anything, which is pretty cool. Um, you can also jump on his back and do certain things to make him shoot lasers. That's all always fun. Their attacks can be modified with the same stick positions that the other characters use, but a lot of their moves have really long windups, and it feels pretty strange to do these inputs and not immediately see the move come out. This leaves V feeling pretty clunky, which might be intentional, but really he's just not super exciting to play as. Again, he's a cool idea, but the problem is that his moveset feels really lacking compared to Nero and Dante, and there's a lot less room for stylish skill expression with him. Also, you know, it's the same kind of thing that made me not care for playing as Lady in DMC4 SE. A ranged playstyle does doesn't really appeal to me in a game like this, and I don't think I'm in the minority in that. But in general, I thought V's levels were kinda boring, but mostly inoffensive. That is, until I got to my DMD playthrough. DMD difficulty is what really made me dread V's missions. Obviously, enemies do a lot more damage and have a lot more health in DMD, which is fine when you've got Nero and Dante's great movement, gap closing, and comboing ability. When you're stuck playing as V, every single enemy feels like a battle of attrition. They just have so much health. This would be one thing if V had fun combos, but he really doesn't, at least not without sitting around labbing out specific sequences all day, which I absolutely have no interest in doing with him. And even then, I'm not sure that any fancy combos on V would be any more efficient at dealing damage than just spamming Nightmare's big laser. His levels are boring on Son of Sparta and they're a chore on DMD, and I've never even bothered to take him into Bloody Palace. Maybe there's some deep mechanics to master with him, but he's really just not fun enough on a base level to make me want to put any time at all into him. So let's just move on. I feel like I'm going to be repeating myself in that DMC4 video here, but Dante is just the most wild, absurd, fantastic third-person action game character that I think has ever been made. It makes DMC4 Dante look like DMC Reboot Dante, and DMC Reboot Dante look like DMC1 Dante. That was probably very confusing, but the point is that the variety of weapons, moves, advanced techniques, and combos available to the player is just staggering in DMC5. We're talking four styles, four melee weapons, four guns, normal DT, Sin DT, and that number jumps up even higher if you're crazy enough to play on irregular full custom. Let's just take a quick look at the weapons in DMC5, not including Rebellion and Sparta just for my own sanity. Every melee weapon has some unique mechanic tied to it that feels at once perfectly suited for the weapon in question and completely unlike anything in DMC before it. Devil Sword Dante, which replaces series staple Rebellion as Dante's new default sword, has a unique mechanic tied to the Swordmaster style where Dante can summon ethereal swords to imitate his moves, but these summoned swords can be used completely independently of what Dante himself is doing, meaning you can mash them to add damage into your combo, use them while you're shooting guns or charging up another move, and probably in a lot of sweet combos that I can't actually think of or do. I love Devil Sword Dante, it was basically my main weapon for most of the game. Balrog is the old standby kick punch weapon, only now it's left stick back and Y will switch between kick mode and blow mode? Oh, blow like a punch. Okay, I was thinking of something else. Both kick and punch mode have their own unique full set of moves with both normal attacks and swordmaster moves. Plus, they both have a different way to activate their special ignition mode that increases your damage, which makes this weapon incredibly versatile. 
Cavalier is two halves of a motorcycle that can be wielded like swords and can also be put together for melee attacks as a full motorcycle, and I really shouldn't have to say anything else about it to get across how hilarious and fun this weapon is. The unique part is that it cuts through armor like butter with its gear wheel mechanic. Any attack that you hit will last for a little while, kind of grind away on the enemy for a second, and pressing the button for the next attack with proper timing will make the next attack come out faster and do more damage, kind of like Dante's own version of Nero's Rev Sword, which actually, now that I think of it, makes perfect sense. Nero has a sword that revs like a motorcycle. Dante saw that and said, how about I just use an actual motorcycle? <laughs> And finally, there's King Cerberus, a returning favorite from DMC3, here upgraded to be easily the most visually impressive weapon in the entire game. Its unique mechanic is its three forms, or more specifically, how you access all of them. Normal attacks use King Cerberus' classic ice form, Swordmaster moves change it into a fire staff, and holding any attack button for a short time after performing a move, then releasing it, will perform a graphically amazing lightning attack as a three-section staff, depending on the stick position and whether you were holding the normal attack button or the Swordmaster style button. I use this one when I'm feeling like just showing off, or I just want to see some eye candy. I mean, god damn, look at that. Crazy thing is, these are just the melee weapons. There's new style actions, double rocket launchers, sin devil trigger, and a hat gun. Sick. But I don't want to spend the entire review telling you what's in the game, I've done plenty of that already. If you want to know what I think of the new additions to Dante's moveset, they're great. Genuinely, I have nothing to say except it all rules. Combat in Devil May Cry is just so freeform for all the characters, but especially with Dante. Other combat games often feel like they're just about showing off cool animations to make the player feel badass without ever actually demanding very much of the player. Uh, this here's just the most relevant combat game footage that I happened to already have recorded. I'm not trying to say that all other action games are as bad as Sonic Unleashed. There's nothing wrong with that kind of game, but the freedom and responsiveness of the DMC games is just on a whole different level from basically any other action game. In DMC 5, Dante's gameplay really feels like a culmination of the years of growth and change that this series has undergone. DMC 3 had a great combat system, amazing variety with five melee weapons and five guns, and just a few too many annoying enemies. 4 took one step forward with an even more robust combat engine and two steps back by paring down Dante's arsenal to only three melee weapons and three guns and introducing even more obnoxious enemies. But 5 is the best of both worlds, amazing mechanical depth, great variety, and enemies that are designed to be satisfying to fight, all presented with the incredible polish you'd expect from a modern AAA game. This is Dante's game, and we're really all just here to soak it in. The way his personality comes through in every aspect of his design is amazing to see. Dante is endless confident, but with the power and skill to back it up, and he loves to have fun, and fighting is what he does for fun. From his animations to his voice clips to the cutscenes, everything about Dante oozes swagger and a love of fighting. And once you start improving at the game, feeling the joy of pulling off some combos, you're gonna start to feel that same rush that Dante feels during every second of gameplay. Even if, like me, you know there's so many levels of mastery far above where you currently are. But I think DMC5 has done some great work to make higher level play more accessible to new players, while still rewarding mastery for really dedicated players. I get why that might disappoint or even anger fans of DMC4 Dante, who had a skill ceiling that hovered somewhere over the Himalayas. But I gotta say, this is a godsend for people like me who feel like they probably could have gotten a handle on the advanced techniques in DMC4 if I had the time or energy to commit to it. DMC5's mechanics lower that bar just enough that I can get the satisfaction of pulling off some really fun and cool looking stuff without having to quit my day job. The main examples of this are the greater aerial control you have in DMC5, enemy steps I think slightly increased range, and the new royal guard mechanics. Jump cancelling was pretty damn precise in DMC4, and while actual good players could use inertia and guard flying and whatever the hell else to position themselves for some perfectly timed jump cancels, plebs like me were a little lost. In DMC5, mercifully, you have what feels like a little more control of where your character goes in the air after you've already jumped. No inertia required. Sad news for those of you who mastered jump cancelling full house into rainstorm, good news for me who can now do moving rainstorms without having to train in the hyperbolic time chamber. Jokes aside, I really do understand why a hardcore DMC4 enthusiast would be annoyed that a system they spent so much time learning is seemingly just being discarded for the sequel. I was a melee kid, so I know what it's like to see a series' precise and rewarding mechanics be stripped away for the sake of mass market appeal. Trust me, I get it. But I can only speak from my experience, and for me the changes are great, especially Royal Guard. 
In DMC 3 and 4, it was pretty easy for enemies to break your guard if you didn't perfectly time it, and this made Royal Guard a pretty unappealing style to new players. My experience was that I tried to use it on occasion, got rolled every time I did, so decided to just make do without it. The more I did that, the more I just got used to playing without it, which meant I never switched to it in DMC 4, even when I should have, which meant I wasn't getting any practice with it, which meant I was having less and less reason to use it. It's one of those things where you need to sit down and decide, okay, I'm gonna grind out some Royal Guard timing practice here, and not everyone's gonna bother to do that. You remember that secret mission in DMC4 where you had the Royal Guard like five times in a row or whatever? That literally took me like two hours. <laughs> It seemed like any non-perfect Royal Guard would be instantly broken by any attack except for the most basic of trash mob attacks, so unless you put the work in to master it, why even bother using it? I like the idea of a high-risk, high-reward defensive style, but for my skill level it just wasn't worth it most of the time. DMC 5's solution to this is so beautiful and so perfect, it feels like it should have worked this way the entire time in 3 and 4. Now, any normal blocks will drain your DT meter and will only break your guard if you don't have any DT left. Royal blocks won't drain any DT and will fill the royal gauge a little extra. Plus, you get a really satisfying sound when you royal block. That makes it way more accessible and easy to use while still rewarding players who nail the timing for a perfect royal block. You'll still get hit if you're too late, so there's a fun element of split-second decision-making when you see an attack coming. You think to yourself, okay, do I play it safe and hold block now, or do I think I can time this right and not lose any DT? In 4, the process for me was, you suck too much to use Royal Guard, so if you don't want to lose half your HP, you better dodge right now. Sounds like something Virgil would say to Dante. Which brings us to Virgil, who came out fairly recently on PC as a $5 DLC. Pretty fair price there, I'd say, and it sure beats buying the special edition on a console for 40 bucks when we all know damn well that Virgil is like 90% of the reason anyone is buying it. He plays pretty similar to how he did in DMC4, same three weapons, same concentration meter, same free teleport cancel out of basically everything shenanigans. Now he's got Doppelganger, which is pretty cool, and some new super screen clearing moves, but overall I just don't have that much to say about him. Like with DMC4, he's pretty damn broken, but you know, sometimes that's what you want, to just hit some buttons and see some cool shit. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not like there isn't some serious mechanical depth to Virgil. There absolutely is. I can't even imagine what wild stuff you could do with Doppelganger mimicking your moves and being able to change on the fly how long the delay is between your moves and his. There's gotta be some impressive stuff you can do there. I'm sure plenty of people on YouTube who are way better at these games than I am have already done awesome stuff. It's just that I'm about 100 hours of practice away from actually pulling off any cool combos with him. So lastly, I do have a few gameplay gripes. The camera is one. This might be the only game where my complaint with the camera is that it actually shows too much. DMC 3 and 4 have this great feature where most enemies won't attack from off screen, so they'll try to get in view and then start an attack. So an easy way to get yourself a little breathing room is to get some enemies off screen. It's really cool, and I don't think I've ever played a game like this where the camera can actually be used strategically to gain an advantage. But DMC 5 has a bad habit of zooming the camera way further out than is necessary, which makes managing some fights harder than it needs to be because it won't let me not look at these enemies. There's also no more locked camera angles, but I honestly kind of miss those for exploration. It was really good at making certain places feel grand and massive, and it felt very old school video gamey to have these locked camera angles. The camera is basically completely free all the time now, which is especially good for combat, but the lack of interesting camera angles makes the locations feel pretty samey when you're running around between fights. And this is another issue I have, the environments. Way too much of this game is set in places with that same weird gray plant rock looking stuff everywhere. The early levels do a good job of selling us the city overtaken by roots idea. We explore subway stations, libraries, churches, hotels, and then the second half of the game takes place entirely in the gray tunnels inside the tree that looks like it's made of rock. I'm also really not a fan of the mystery doors that just kind of teleport you around to random disconnected paths inside the tree, though I guess that does help in getting across the idea that the tree is an impossibly massive, otherworldly maze, so I'll give that a pass. I'm not saying that this is a deal breaker, it's just kind of boring to look at. And speaking of looking at things, lock on. I don't like that you can't switch targets while moving. This was never a problem before, so I don't know why they changed it, but in this game, you can't 
click in the left stick to change targets while you're moving. The left stick has to be neutral in order to change targets, which is just really, really weird. And with the number of enemies that teleport around in this game, being able to quickly switch lock-on targets to the one you want is more important than ever, so I'm not sure why they restricted it to only being able to switch targets when you aren't moving. It's very odd. Again, not a deal breaker, but it's a definite annoyance. So. Here at the end of this series, well, I'm kind of surprised that I made it to the end, and a little disappointed that the videos took me this long to make. I started this series almost a year and a half ago, but I'm glad I committed to it, and it was worth it all to get to this game. Let's cap this off by ranking the games in the series just real quick, since I know people will be asking about this. In last place, we have DMC2. No surprises here, this is the bad one. Pistols the game, total trash, even Jay's Reviews has finally admitted that this is a terrible, terrible game. In fifth place, we have DMC1. This one hasn't aged super well, but I think it's still enjoyable as kind of a first draft what the series would become. Plus, it's got the funniest dialogue, so that's fun. Fourth place is the reboot. I'll be honest, I still like this game. Quite a bit, actually, and this series of videos started as a way for me to figure out why this franchise was so sacred and why this game wasn't what the fans wanted. And after playing every game, I kind of get it. There's definitely better games in the franchise, and it's a pretty unnecessary reboot, but I think there's still a lot of fun to be had with it. Third place is DMC4. Yeah, as much as I love the combat in this one, the crap story and blatantly unfinished content is just too much in this one. With its terrible platforming and level gimmicks and backtracking, I cannot in good conscience put this one over second place, DMC3. Great story, great characters, and excellent combat. DMC3 is considered by many to be the real start of the franchise. It set a new high bar for action games all the way back in 2005, and many would argue that the only game since then to exceed that bar is number one, DMC5. No surprise, no contest, DMC5 is the full package. You could argue for 3 having a better story, I personally wouldn't, but a lot of people do, and you could argue that 4 has deeper combat mechanics, but what 5 has is the perfect balance. Best game in the franchise, easily the best action game I've ever played, and when the day comes that they make Devil May Cry 6, I will be lining up on day 1 to play it. And with that, finally, this video series is over, and I can... I don't know, finally talk about some other games on this channel. This has basically just been a DMC channel for the last year, and uh, for those of you who subscribed for that, I apologize, but I'm probably not going to make many more Devil May Cry videos after this. But if you're interested, stick around, subscribe, and I'll have more videos coming for you soon. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time.